Our brains, like the rest of us, change as we age. And while some of those changes are negative, they are not all inevitable. And there are ways for older brains to adapt and stay strong throughout our working years and into retirement. Bryn Weingart teaches at the Schulich Executive Education Center at York University, and she joins us now for more. And you're going to forgive my doing this, but for some of us of a certain generation, the last name Weingard, right, we raise our eyebrows. Yeah. Your grandpa was in Brian Mulroney's cabinet. That's right, yes. He, he was, was Minister of Science for minister, Mulroney. Back in the day. Yep, back so in the day. That's the good old days. That's your grandfather. Yeah. Let's just put that on the record. Yeah. Bryn, how do our brains change as we move towards our senior years? Yep, you know, so our brains change uh, physically, functionally, and vocationally. Physically, the way that they change, you know, and, and a lot of us know this kind of inherently through social media or, or through, you know, public information, if you will, is that our gray matter actually decreases. So gray matter are the neurons themselves. When you were born, you had 200 billion neurons. And now, you know, when you became a full adult at about 25, you had 100 billion neurons, which, of course, confounds many people. They perceive that they would have more. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you have less neurons, more connective tissue and nerve fibers. Um, and then as we age, we get to about, uh, you know, a low number would be about 85 billion neurons at our death. And so, you know, that sounds like less, but really 85 billion is still enough to do everything we need to do. The thing that also is decreasing are the nerve fibers. So the actual dendrites and axons themselves, um, and then the myelin tissue on those axons that is starting itself to degenerate. And so but the implications of losing all that gray matter are what? Are, are that effectively, of course, you're going to decrease in your ability to remember things. You're going to decrease in your conductivity, in your connectivity, um, and therefore in your ability to process information. And so different types of information you're, you get better at and other types you get worse at. What do you get better at? You get better, uh, you know, at um, emotional intelligence, at interpersonal insight. You get better at uh, the mirror neuron system, we call it. That becomes more acute. You get better at theory of mind, we call it, which is the ability to perceive what someone else might be thinking or feeling. Um, you get better at, at uh, all kinds of reasoning when it comes to longitude, when it comes to cause and effect, consequence, planning, that kind of thing. So, you know, you get uh, a lot better also when it comes to uh, optimism and bright side thinking. Part of the reason there is because negative memories decay first. Huh. And so, the, you know, that's the, the effect of nostalgia, right? The rose-colored glasses. As we look back on our life, things look a lot better than they actually were. But that has serves us very well as we age because then it means that our outlook, past predicts future in our, in our mind's eye, our outlook looks a lot more bright. So we actually become whatever we were to begin with, we become more optimistic as we hmm. age. Uh, so you can't remember where you put your keys, but you have all these other wonderful things that do happen. Right. Okay, so it um, doesn't sound like a terrible trade-off. Uh, there's a term that I ran into in reading the research for this called functional reorganization. Yes. What does that mean? Functional reorganization is effectively the brain knowing that it's tripping, mm -hmm. and it's starting to have not just redundant centers, but storing uh, information in multiple locations, um, and that's different than a neural network, which of course stores information within the network, you know, throughout the brain. It mm -hmm. actually stores it multiply, so it stores it, you know, so that you are able to access it um, via different networks, the same idea, the same information. Um, so functional reorganization is the ability, you know, the brain and all brain tissue is very opportunistic. So anything not being used will be reappropriated for the neural networks that are being practiced. <laughs> and so the brain knows this and it will functionally reorganize itself in order to use any neurons that are free in the interest of, in, you know, continued productivity or um, conductivity, if you will, throughout the life course. So you get better at, no, uh, your brain gets better at compensating for its failures. That is quite amazing, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> Do you know why? No, well, I mean, the human brain is designed to, you know, last you through your life, right? It's really designed to be the most efficient thing it possibly can be. It's one of the most energetically expensive organs that we have. And so it not just uses all the neurons that it has, but to your benefit. Let's consider the workplace. Are there things that brain science shows that younger workers are inherently better at than their older colleagues. Yes. So one of the things we forget is is that we we learn how to learn. Like we we learn how it is that we have to intake new information when we're young. We get worse at things like rote 
uh, learning. We get worse at, um, or I, what said differently, when we're young, we're better at rote learning. We're better at explicit knowledge, right? We don't have as much tacit knowledge. That's how to do up your shoe. But things that we know we know are explicit to us. We are better at that when we're younger. Um, we're better at things that involve risk. We become less risk tolerant as we grow older. Uh, we are better at things that involve experimentation, innovation, trying new things. I mean, those are all uh, you know, you know, traits that are really relegated to the younger of us. And the older of us, as we get older, we get worse at that and we get less willing to do that. Do you think most employers know how to take advantage of the cognitive assets of their older employees? You know, I think that there is a real divide. To some extent, yes, because we do, especially, you know, in other cultures more, but in this culture as well, we take into account wisdom, which is something that, of course, grows over the life course mm -hmm. um, and, and can grow infinitely. And so we do know that that's relevant. Um, the, where I think we see the most problem in the workforce is actually in the succession planning, so is in the conflict between older workers that we do value and do often know how to use and, and you know, put to work, partly because whether you're the employer or the employee and the older worker, you've been in the workforce long enough, you know what you're good at mm -hmm. and you know what you're getting better at and worse at. And so you're able to sort of put yourself in the way of success. Um, it's the younger workers that don't have that experience that are harder to use. And it's the, the lack of meeting, ne'er the two shall meet, so to speak, when it mm -hmm. comes to older and younger workers. Lots of conflict there. And so succession planning is really the biggest problem. So is seniority a good thing in the workplace? Seniority can be a good thing in the workplace for sure, because as we get older, we get better at so many of the things that, you know, organizations, whether that's, you know, for profit or otherwise, need, right? So things like strategizing, long-term planning, um, overseeing everyone, management, leadership, um, mediating, negotiating, those are all skills, traits, roles that we would give to an older worker or an older brain, differently said, is better at than a younger brain. Um, and so, you know, those are certainly when it comes to younger workers, those are things that they should, they should stick to sort of technical, technological, more tactical things, less strategic things. Gotcha. Let's talk about what happens after you've done your 30, 35, 40 years in the workforce and then you retire. What does retirement do to the brain? Yeah, so there are eight stages of retirement. Um, the first, of course, is what we call fantasy, and that's anywhere, you know, in the literature, we'll say five years beforehand, but that could be any time, right? Um, then we have the excitement phase. We know we're going to retire. Actually, T equals zero when you're retiring is very stressful. That's the stress phase. Um, and that's, you know, people underestimate that. People believe that they're going to be able to retire. It's going to be, you know, fun. It's going to be great. They do go through a honeymoon stage typically just after the stress stage. And then as routine sets in. So, you know, the, the honeymoon stage is when you get to go golfing with your friends. You get to make that chest of drawers, <laughs> right? You get to see your grandkids more. And then all of a sudden as that routine sets in, you realize that with the job went economic stability went uh, your social and peer group, Absolutely. went your contribution to society, went, um, you know, how it is that you are, are conceptualized yourself, so your identity, sense of self. And so people really set into this disenchantment phase. And, and everyone's different. I mean, the literature will tell you that there are, a, there are ranges of years that this happens in. We're noticing with the baby boomer population that this is a condensed process, where they go through that disenchantment phase earlier than expected. Um, and that, it's in that phase that then we see baby boomers come back to the workforce, right? We've, you hear all the time about someone who's retired two or three times, and in that case, you know, this is when someone comes back and says, I need to work because it's where my sense of self is. It's how I, you know, contribute. It's what I've known all my life. All of what you just described, presumably it can happen before you turn 65 if you retire before 65. Is that absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yes, huh. absolutely. Okay. How about uh, any differences in the brain between men and women? in terms yeah. of retirement? Yeah, um, there is. So one of the things we know is an example about, uh, it's called the grandmother effect. Um, but really, you know, with women, they get a lot more uh, value as we get older. The reward centers are highlighted when they're dealing with social circumstances, their grandchildren, their own progeny. So for them to leave the workforce is typically not as stressful as for men. Men experience a lot more stress associated with, especially uh, differences now in their social ranking, mm. in their economic stability about ego. That's, I mean, Men can't stand the ego drop. It's a problem, right? No. As well as the fact that now you're usually on a budget that has, has is, is less than it <laughs> used to be. Also, there's a difference in their sexual appetite because men as we, and this is very important, it's one of the things we say for ensuring brain health, uh, men stay reproductive throughout their life. Mm 
whereas okay. women do not. So when suddenly a man retires and he's you know, realizing sort of his full self again, he looks at the wife, let's say, of 40 years and realizes that she's not in that same place. Mm -hmm. And so there are very real differences associated with a lot of the hormonal circadian, mm -hmm. neuro, you know, neuroscientific um, and psychological components of retirement for men that are just not true for women. Women will find you know, relief in different places than men will and so on. I don't know if you, you can answer this, but the, 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 I'm, I'm always astonished when you hear people who have been married 40 or 45 years and then get divorced. Is that part of the explanation? This is actually right at the retirement stage in that disenchantment stage is when we see that <clears throat> bubble, that little <clears throat> blip on the graph, if you will, of divorces. It's when <clears throat> suddenly you look at one another again and realize, you know, as empty nesters or whatever, that it wasn't just that we were in the work. It wasn't just because we were busy with work. It's because <clears throat> we really have grown apart. And like I say, women not reproductive through the life, life course, <clears throat> men are. And so temptation and distraction and so on get a lot more real for them once their work life is over. Let's talk about some of these strategies, and we've seen them, you know, they're all over the place online. Um, studies, exercises, whatever, trying to determine how well these uh, little brain teasers work. Brain training sites. Here we go. A 2010 study by the neuroscientist Dr. Adrian Owen, which tracked 11,000 adults over a six-week computer-based training regime designed to improve reasoning, memory, planning, visual spatial skills and attention, reported benefits in executing the tasks themselves but little general advantage in other areas. Let me just, let me have you weigh in on that yeah. for starters. All those brain teasing exercises online, right. worth it? No, probably not. Really? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that a lot of learning, including rote learning that we get worse at, creates, you know, takes more effort as we get older. Um, a lot of learning is very contextual. And so the skills that you're learning on some of those online, you know, brain teaser, brain building mm. um, uh, sites really are specific to that site and they're specific to that test. So you get better at taking those tests, at doing those quizzes, at solving those issues, but you don't get better. Those not, they're non-transferable necessarily. Mm. Um, what we, you know, you notice is that if someone, as an example, there is some bleed when it comes to real life contextualized learning, that then they get better at other things. So we know that there's a relationship, as an example, between mathematics and musical ability, right? And so there are things like that that can help you, um, uh, you know, have transferable skills, but they're not necessarily in the gamified version of them. Mm -hmm. you, I don't know if you saw this uh, multi-million dollar fine leveled against Luminosity because they claimed that, uh, you know, you do what they put out there and your brain's gonna, so it's, it's not true. No, not only that, but we know from psychometry that IQ is actually one of the most pervasive, consistent personality traits over the life course. So it's unlikely that any gamified you know, version of that would really increase your IQ over time. So we're doing all these crossword puzzles for nothing. Crossword puzzles are good for cognitive stimulation, which is one of the things that we should be doing, of ah, course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in retirement years, crossword puzzles, yes. Yes. Sudoku, yes? Sure. Ken, Ken, okay. yes. What I, I sort of bucket all that under cognitive stimulation. So do whatever keeps you cognitively stimulated. Now, no different than going to the gym when you're, you know, trying to lift weight you really do have to, if you want to maintain your that muscle mass, that brain mass, you really do have to feel the burn in the sense that... Feel the burn means something different these days, <laughs> brain. Know. you got to know that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no. You're following I, the U.S. campaign? Yes, okay, Feel the burn you. is something different. Yeah. <laughs> um, in this sense, though, really, you know, challenging yourself. If you're not outside your comfort zone while learning something new, and by that I don't mean Ken Ken, I mean, you know, learning a new language, learning a new city, hmm. taking up a new craft. I had someone come up to me the other day and said, you know, I feel old. Am I too old to be uh, to take on my, my real estate license? And I said, absolutely not. Those are the kinds of things that are going to challenge you enough to continue to have that mass maintained. Okay, a real estate license I get, but, but I have heard some people say, you know what, I'm 65, I'm 70, it's too late for me to learn a new language. It's just too tough. Is that true? Well, what we know is that it's easier prepubescently sure. because there's more neuroplasticity. Yeah. However, contrary to some of the earlier research, we know that neuroplasticity does not go to zero when you're older. And in fact, while it takes longer to learn and it's more effort, mm -hmm. you are absolutely still capable of learning into any year of your life. Hmm. Okay. You mentioned a second ago about the exercise. We, we obviously know physical exercise is good for your physical health. Do you have 
evidence that suggests that physical exercise is good for your brain health as well. Yes, so uh, that's the, another good point, is that you know exercise relieves, uh, relieves, uh, releases endorphins and encephalins and other uh, hormones through the, the HPA axis, your circadian rhythms run through this axis. You know, that is really critical for not just relieving stress, but also actually improving some of your, your neural matter and your, you know, what we know you're losing as we age, that um, those axons, the nerve fibers, so actually maintaining those nerve fibers, a lot of that activity really critical. It maintains the health of not only neural synapses and processing, but also of the neural hormones and chemicals required to do all that. Let's do, uh, we're going to finish up on a real life example here. Okay. Your grandpa, who we talked about off the top. Yep. He's 92 now. 92. Does he do all of this stuff that you recommend? He's, so he's truly amazing. He yeah, is. he does. I mean, his knee hurts, of course, you know, and his heart isn't the strength that it used to be, um, but he stays as active as you can imagine. He also does what I, you know, he's taken up hobbies, of course. Some of them include veteran affairs and, and, and um, you know, fundraising initiatives. That's one he, of the he things. He was a vet. Yeah, well, he fought in World War II, absolutely. Um, and so that's one of the things that I recommend. He also reads to children in, in preschools, um, and that's another thing that's working in some capacity, which is another thing that I recommend. Uh, he stays social, which is another thing that we recommend, right? So he shakes new hands and greets new people, and that, of course, allows for new synaptic you know, attachment, more neuroplasticity. So staying social, I mean, he's doing all the things that, that you absolutely should be doing, including, I have to say, he does a quite a bit of laughing, telling jokes, and that is bar none the best medicine. Good sense of humor never yeah. hurts anything, yeah. does it? Bryn, it's great to meet you. Thanks for coming so in nice at TVO to tonight. You. That's Bryn Weingard, who's with the faculty of the Schulich Executive Education Center and with Ryerson and with the University of Guelph. Yes, she's a busy person. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.